Now, what's an automatic thought? It's a thought that comes that you did not initiate consciously or volitionally. You didn't say, you know what? I'm going to decide this about that. You think about doing something, you think about going somewhere, you think about, you know, uh, if you're a dater asking somebody out, you think about if you're wanting to enhance your career, I'm going to go take a course. I might get another degree. I might make a sales call. I might go visit this church or I might go visit this group or whatever. And instantly the first thought that comes and you kind of like have gotten so used to it, guys, that it's automatic. But what you don't realize is that it is automatic. You didn't choose it. You don't control it. It comes from a network of memories and experiences and maybe things that you've been taught or maybe things you were taught under duress by trauma, by harsh treatment in a previous relationship, even families of origin. It may be an automatic thought that you have gotten from experience. In other words, something has happened to you that showed you this is the way things work. This is the way things are. Things like, well, nobody's going to listen to me or nobody's going to care what I have to say or nobody's going to really help. They're only going to judge me or I have nothing to offer or the future is hopeless or I won't be allowed to do that or, you know, <laughs> There are no good ones out there, meaning whatever good ones, maybe dates, maybe churches, maybe people, maybe jobs, maybe whatever it is. And these thoughts come. So what happens? You started with a desire. You started with a dream. You started with a pain that you want to do something about. And your heart and your soul is saying, you know what? I want to. And then bam. Automatic thought. Well, that won't work. That'll probably fail. People try that. It doesn't really work. You got to, you know, that's, and it's automatic. And then what it does is it keeps you imprisoned. Okay. Keeps you in prison. Now, here's a great analogy from long ago. You probably most of you guys are not young enough to have ever gone to the old traveling you're not young enough. How the heck can you be? You're not old enough. That's what I meant to say. You didn't go to the old traveling circus like I used to go to. It would come to town. My mom and daddy would take me to, to the circus. We're going to the circus. And you go in and you see these elephants and they're kind of standing there. They're not going anywhere. And around their ankle, you know, there's this little rope or this little chain and a stake in the ground. <laughs> The elephant could pull the whole tent down if he wanted to. So how did that work? Well, what I've always been told, I guess you can go Google this, even if it's not true, it's a great analogy. <laughs> it's when they was a little bitty elephant and he did not have the strength to oppose the forces that chained him up with that little bitty rope, they would, put that rope around his ankle and he'd start to move and he couldn't move it. And he couldn't move it. And he couldn't move it. And then he learned, I can't do anything. I can't move it. He stopped trying. Well, that little elephant got bigger, kept eating all those peanuts. Those kids would feed him as they went by. Sounds like a bedtime story. Didn't it? And he kept eating the peanuts and he got bigger and his trunk got longer and his legs got stronger. But he never noticed that he could if he tried. And if he didn't listen to that voice inside that says it'll ever work. Well, that's us. We have experiences, we have trauma, we have oppression, we have criticism. Just stuff that at one point, overpowered you, it was too big, there's too much rejection, there was too much lack of opportunity, there was too much, whatever it was. And just like the elephant, we learned, can't do it. Now what happens when that big elephant says, hey, I wanna go, no, you can't, you're tied to the stake. 
see a lot of these automatic thoughts are telling you things that probably were true at one point when your circle was that big you know to a child you ever heard people say well everybody is critical everybody's rejecting everybody well where do you, what are you talking about there's how many billions of people in the world that's just not true but when the sentence was formed in your head if it happened when you were a little kid or it happened in some sort of a you know oppressive little cult like even a family or even a relationship where you got gaslighted it was true everybody's rejecting everybody's unavailable everybody because everybody was the little world that you were too little to get out of or later maybe too oppressed to get out of like the elephant and when that sentence comes everybody's like this well yeah that was true but it is no longer true but the automatic thought will tell you it is the automatic thought will tell you you're not good enough and these things can be implanted by people in power. I've shared this story with you, I think, maybe I have, before. Um, one of my favorite things I have in my study, right over there, I could go get it to you and show you, is a, uh, I have it framed. I framed it for my daughters when they were growing up because I wanted them to learn something that when you try something and it doesn't work, that doesn't mean it's not going to work. It doesn't mean you're not good enough. That doesn't mean... You won't ever be successful in that. It's just one event. So I framed this letter. You know what the letter is? When I wrote my first book, Changes That Heal. And I sent it out to publishers. I, first one back, it was, it was the biggest publisher that there was, the one that I had hoped for, the one that I had wanted to get to publish the book. I got a letter back. Dear Dr. Cloud, I'm going to summarize the letter for you. This sucks. That's basically what they said. This is too professorial. It's too academic. Nobody will ever read this. Nobody really cares about this besides blah, 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 blah. And we suggest maybe, maybe you, maybe you turn it into an academic article somewhere and submit it, but it'll never be a book. And we have no interest in publishing. And I think you ought to give up on this. That's basically what it said. Well, that was however many decades ago. And, uh, you know, changes that he all found its audience and, you know, millions of copies later um that little rope around that book's ankle it said this is not readable or it nobody will want to read it that just wasn't true but um could have listened to that and said well wanted to write books hmm, i guess it's just not me and that's just one example. So many we have in our lives. I've got a thousand. You have thousands in your life. But you know what? I'm a person of faith. And my Bible tells me that God made each person and designed them to be his, one of my favorite verses, his workmanship. Like an artist creates something. You're his unique workmanship that he created. And then it says this, to go do good things with who you are and your talents and your abilities. And then it says those good things have been laid out ahead of you so that you might walk in them. But that elephant can't walk if it listens to the automatic thought that says this will never work. I'm not good enough. They'll just reject me. So I want you to do something today. I want you to, as you go through the day and you're thinking about, uh, you know, what you might want, what you might desire to do, somebody you might want to invite to lunch, some sales call you want to make, some losing 50 pounds, some getting out of a difficult dynamic or situation. And that thought comes, that'll never work. And generally what research shows is these thoughts are really usually about a few things. They're about yourself. Okay. They'll some way devalue you and make you not good enough. Or there's something about the world, the outside world, either the people 
or the opportunities or the world at large. And then the third thing is about the future. Negative thoughts about the future. You know, we're in a pretty negative um, reality right now in a lot of areas that we've never seen before. That's true. Those things are true. There are also bright spots out there and there are people that are doing amazing things. And there are people that are helping each other that don't have bright spots. And there are really, really good things to be seen and found in the world if we are looking for them, not denying the negatives. And remember, this human race is on a long journey and there have been dark times before. And that will always be. One of my favorite verses, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation is the word that he used. That means really bad things. He said, but take courage for I've overcome the world. So that's why I say when we start out reaching out to him and reaching out to those that he has given that are the angels and the help and the hands. But you know what that takes? It takes two things. It takes humility to reach out and ask for help from people. Sometimes, sometimes it's easier to reach out to God than it is to people, but he also tells us to reach out to each other. Sometimes it takes, I got to admit that I need help. And that's also courage, humility and courage. It takes courage to go against that fear. And if that person does reject you, it takes courage to go the second mile in that and ask another one and another one, like the publishers. <laughs> John Grisham's a good example of this. He's what, I don't know, what's he up to 150 million books, 200 million, I don't know, it's it's crazy number. I read that his first book, A Time to Kill, was rejected by 35 publishers. He kept sending it, he kept sending it. Come on, guys. Let's declare war on the automatic thoughts that are imprisoning you. And that starts today by just listening to them. Then I want you to start writing them down. And when you write them down, I want you to learn how to dispute them with comebacks. Okay? And those can be comebacks of your favorite verses. That's not what God says about me. They can be comeback of realities. That's not what my friend Susie says about me. See, we have comebacks, but we got to use them. And to do that, we got to take stewardship over these thoughts. Like another one of my favorite verses says, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, because he's the one that said, you are his workmanship. So if that thought says that you're not, then you take captive that thought and say, shut up. That's not what he said. That's not what God says about me. I'll show you, Bob. Um, 